Today, we are here to confer an honorary degree upon Rebecca Jameson. In acknowledgement of her accomplishments as a champion of leading positive changes in education for First Nations people through work at the local, provincial, and federal levels. I'm delighted to present her to this convocation. To present our distinguished candidate, I now call upon Dr. John Durkinson, Vice Pro Provost, Academic Pro Programs. Rebecca Jameson. For many years, Indigenous peoples in Canada have lived with the long shadow cast by residential schools, um, as the recent report by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada reminded us. The education of Aboriginal children was aimed at assimilation rather than an affirmation of their cultural values and identity. Assimilation was still prevailing uh, and was still the prevailing orientation in the 1960s when Rebecca Jameson joined an experimental program at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where she and fellow students began developing a vision for Aboriginal education that would realize Aboriginal values. She stands before us to be uh, honored for the outstanding leadership she has provided in Aboriginal education. Rebecca Jameson was born in Michigan and moved to the Grand River Territory when she was two years old, and it remains her home to this day. Her formal education includes the Native Social Counselor Certi Certificate from the University of Toronto, the Ontario Teacher Certificate from the Ontario Teacher Education College in Hamilton, a BA in Psychology and Philosophy from Wilfrid Laurier University, a Master of Education degree, and all of the coursework of a doctoral degree completed at the University of Toronto. From her start, as a secondary and post-secondary social counselor with Six Nations, Ms. Jameson took on roles of increasing responsibility as a teacher, consultant, and director of student services and counseling with the Grand River Post-Secondary Education Office. In 2009, she was appointed president and CEO of Six Nations Polytechnic. She has served on many boards, including several university boards of governors, as well as on numerous provincial and national bodies as an advisor on matters from education to health to governance. Ms. Jameson has been honored with the Order of Ontario for her contributions to Aboriginal post-secondary education. Ms. Jameson was a founding member of the Grand River Polytechnic Institute, now Six Nations Polytechnic. From its beginnings 22 years ago with the class of 12 students, Six Nations Polytechnic has grown into one of the leading Aboriginal institutes in Ontario. It now numbers 200 students, some of whom have the opportunity to complete year one of a university degree in their own community in an educational setting shaped by their values. And if a proposal that is now before the provincial government is approved, Six Nations Polytechnic would be the first Aboriginal institute to offer a self-standing undergraduate degree in Indigenous language. With its Indigenous Knowledge Centre, Six Nations Polytechnic has become a critical link in preserving and cultivating Aboriginal language and culture. Research is affirming and further revitalizing oral traditions and ceremonial practices, and a virtual archive is being developed for researchers in the future. Ms. Jameson has cultivated many partnerships with universities and colleges, including Western, and her leadership benefits not only Aboriginal communities, but enriches us all. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and in the name of Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, upon Rebecca Jameson. By virtue of the authority vested in me as Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Congratulations, Dr. Jameson.
On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumna, Dr. Rebecca Jameson, to address convocation. Sego, Scano, and Sigoli. Greetings, distinguished platform party, graduates, parents, family, friends, and guests. Thank you. I'm truly honored by this expression of recognition, and I accept it with humility, as I acknowledge that it's collective efforts of many dedicated people who have, I, I've had the privilege to work with over the years that have helped make possible any accomplishments that I'm associated with. And I'm truly honored to be included in your celebration of accomplishments, graduates, as this is a once-in-a-lifetime event for you. To those of you who are graduating today, I understand and appreciate the dedication and commitment it's taken for you to get to this day. So please accept my warmest and sincere congratulations. I also extend special acknowledgement to family, friends, teachers, professors, mentors, and colleagues who supported you to this point. Your collective efforts have produced landmark achievements that are proof of the spirit of the human spirit. So I encourage you to celebrate and savor this special moment in your lives. Like you have had, I have had good fortune and had many supportive family, friends, wonderful teachers, mentors, and colleagues who have shared the journey with me to this day. And I am grateful for every one of them. I especially want to acknowledge my family members who are with me today, my husband of 49 years, Ron, my sons, Darren and Matthew, and my granddaughter, Carly, who will be graduating from this university soon. I know. <laughs> I know other family members and friends are watching, so know that you're in my thoughts, and I know you're with me. Thank you for your love and support. When I look at the faculties that are represented today by the graduates, I just couldn't help but be impressed by the potential that's in this room. So I'm very impressed to be, I'm very pleased to be here with you and to take this opportunity to share with you some key teachings from my culture about our collective responsibilities for leaving a legacy of hope and to encourage you to accept this responsibility by becoming involved in the growing efforts to build positive relationships with the Aboriginal peoples in Canada. As many of you know, and as John mentioned, in order to re um, redress the legacy of residential schools and advance the process of Canadian reconciliation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada issued 94 calls to action. If you haven't read the calls to action, I encourage you to do so, as they will have an impact on us all. While the calls to action may present challenges, they also present opportunities to participate in creating a more hopeful future. This afternoon, I intend to share with you some of my experiences as I have worked with others to build a future filled with hope. One of my mentors, a traditional knowledge carrier, now passed on, told me, as she tutored me in the language, you know when you wake up, it's when he's real. It's a good day. Because you've been given one more day to be alive, and that means one more day to help others and to take care of the ones you love and the ones to come. That statement was, and is very, as a very powerful statement of responsibility and hope. And I'm grateful to be reminded of it daily. Every day, I report to duty first to my family, and then most days to Six Nations Polytechnic, or SNP as we call it now, where my efforts are devoted to my community and those who wish to join us in creating a society where distinct peoples coexist in respectful peace. I'm guided in what I do by our traditional teachings. We are taught to consider the impacts of our decisions for seven generations. We're taught that all things in creation have a role better understood as a duty. We're taught that when taken together, these duties mean that life exists in a web of interdependence, a web where we will find land, air, water, plants, animals, human, and spirits. We're taught to appreciate the interdependence of all things and conduct ourselves accordingly. We're taught to act in ways that will leave the planet capable of sustaining all life. We're taught that when this web of life becomes imbalanced, then we are all at risk. 
Out of these teachings come the required practices of sharing and respectful accommodation of others and the stewardship of all things that sustain life. We have learned from experience that when these fundamental principles are ignored, then imbalance and injustice emerges, if not chaos and eventually destruction. When imbalance and injustice invades our world, we are taught there's only one course of action, one responsibility. Do what you can to restore that balance required to sustain life, the necessary conditions for hope. How did I learn all of this? I certainly did not learn it as part of my formal education. I learned it from mentors in my community at Grand River and from other Haudenosaunee communities that have maintained our traditional knowledge and ways of living and were willing to share it with me when I sought them out. To them, I am truly grateful. I was born in the last century in the 50s and raised on the res. My father persuaded the local education authorities to let me start school at the age of six instead of the usual seven likely because I was such a nuisance at home. <laughs> I started in a one-room school with eight grades and a wood stove, but we did have electricity for lights. My first grade teacher was Mr. Harvey Longville, who had just been recently hired by another gentleman by the name of Mr. Joseph Hill. Later in life, both men would become community education leaders, my friends, mentors, colleagues, and Harvey and I would go on to work together with community educators and grassroots activists to create what is now Six Nations Polytechnic. Did a passion for education based on Indigenous values begin in that one-room school? I'll let you decide. I did acquire the basic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic for sure, and I learned all about the brave explorers who discovered the Americas. I knew all about the sailing routes of Columbus. Vasco da Gama, and followed Ponce de Leon's search for the Fountain of Youth. Although I went to res elementary school on the res, not once in my elementary or secondary education off reserve were Native peoples, Aboriginal peoples, Indigenous peoples ever part of the curriculum. Not once was a word spoken by my teachers or students in one of our languages. In the education that I experienced, the model children presented in the curriculum were Dick, Jane, and Sally. And by the way, none of them were people of color. They were all part of a very ideal family with a father who wore a tie, a mother with a necklace and a dress, a dog named Spot, a cat named Puff, and a house with a picket fence. Reflecting on that experience, my education, through my education lens, I realize now how powerful that experience was. Not once did anyone say, this is what your family should look like. Not once did anyone say this is what your house should look like, how you should speak. But because my reality was never reflected in any of the texts or images that we studied, because we, never, we were never taught or even talked about our heroes or history, I concluded that, when I was, that what I was being taught in school, and being graded on by the way, mattered. And what I was experiencing in my life and had heard about at home did not matter. Like so many Indian kids, I was growing up in what I now call the oxymoron period of segregation for assimilation. Through government policies of controls over our lands, resources, and learning, we were managed and given the clear messages that what mattered is that we either stay out of the way on the res or blend in, and above all, keep all things Indian hidden or underground. The powers of assimilation were strong, and we were all affected by this. Although the required Indian agent pass to leave the reserve was no longer in effect in the 50s when I was born, my family lived with the legacy of what was truly apartheid. The right to vote for, the right to vote for Indians was legislated in 1960. I can remember my father talking about this historical change. Because prior to this, the only way that Indians, now First Nations, could vote was to give up your treaty rights and your Indian status. Oh, and by the way, treaty rights and Indian status were easily lost. If someone with Indian status served in the armed forces, obtained a university degree, or became a professional such as a doctor or lawyer, they would automatically lose their Indian status as they were now considered civilized. This, in the public policy of the day, was considered a desirable achievement. 
So it shouldn't come as a surprise that in 2015, the issue of whether or not to vote is still very much debated among First Nations, as it's seen by many as an assimilationist tactic. Segregation for assimilation was the mission of residential schools. The efforts to kill the Indian and the child were never stronger than in those schools. Children were frequently forcibly removed from their families and communities, and then subjected to inhumane conditions of him inadequate food, as well as emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. The legacy of this system remains with us today, and we all continue to be affected by its injustices. One of the most infamous residential schools, the Mohawk Institute, our mush hole, operated in our territory until the 70s, and none of us are untouched by its legacy. I can still remember the mush hole kids running to escape when they were let off the bus at the Six Nations Fall Fair. And it wasn't until many years later that I heard firsthand the unspeakable treatment of the children in that school. For some who claim not to have been mistreated while they were there, they came away from the experience wanting nothing to do with their community, traditions, or languages. They may not have been beaten, but their minds were changed forever, as were their families and community. During this period, our languages and traditional knowledge went underground. Our languages were not spoken in public, our parents and parents chose not to teach their children to speak, to keep them safe, and to help them fit in. So how did a kid from the res with these experiences become the president of an Indigenous-owned, operated, and governed institution of higher learning? An institution with a special obligation to the Six Nations community to be the formal post-secondary institute to ensure that our Indigenous knowledge and Haudenosaunee languages do not disappear from the face of the earth. A truly one-of-a-kind institution of higher learning. Let me begin by setting a bit of a context. The Institute, SNP, was established by a community of people with a history that predates the formation of Canada or the United States. Six Nations in the Grand River Territory is also the most populous First Nation in Canada and has many related Haudenosaunee communities in both Canada and the U.S. So there are many of us and we have been around for a long time. My role in all of this is a bit of being at the right place at the right time. Some might say it was meant to be, but most importantly, it's a story of, sustainable, of a sustainable Indigenous worldview that provides the motivation to transform challenges and obstacles into opportunities. A story of a worldview in which fulfilling our responsibilities is fundamental. I'm a baby boomer, and the baby boomers had the benefit of living through and being affected by the activism of the 60s the Civil Rights Movement, Flower Power, and the Indian Rights Movement. I sometimes call this the period of awakening, as personal and collective empowerment emerged as the driving theme. You may not know that from the time of the first treaties on this continent and the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and then the Treaty of Niagara in 1764, successive governments knew that there was a special relationship with the first peoples of this land that had to be attended to. But as I've shared with you from my experiences, this relationship wasn't always attended to in the best interest of the original peoples of the land. This has been the case, actually, for over two centuries. In 69, in 1969, a white paper, for those of you who know public policy and law, is a policy paper. It was issued by the Government of Canada, proposing to end the special legal relationship between Aboriginal Canadians, Aboriginal peoples in Canada, and the Canadian state, and dismantling the Indian Act, the legislation that controlled most aspects of our lives. This paper was the kindling of an unprecedented firestorm of activism in Indian country. I can remember my father saying at the time that while the Indian Act was a race-based law, it was the only legal hammer we had to keep the government from sweeping our rights out the door, the rights that we understood would exist as long as the grass grows, the rivers flow, and the sun shines. I recommend, if you haven't done it, to read Harold Cardinal's response in The Unjust Society, in which he articulated the sentiment of betrayal felt in Indian country at the time. In 1972, the National Indian Brotherhood, now the Assembly of First Nations, issued a First Nations policy document called Indian Control of Indian Education. This was a significant statement about reclaiming control over our lives through education, 
while maintaining the special relationship with Canada and the First Peoples of the land. It was a statement about responsibilities. The dialogue leading to this policy paper was highly impactful, and as a result of this advocacy in the early 70s, experimental programs were created with a Native focus to train Natives to work in education as counselors and teachers. So I was enrolled in one of those programs, actually both of them, counseling and teaching. And this is where, for the first time, I encountered a group of Indigenous people from other First Nations, all interested in finding ways for education to benefit their people. Being part of that cohort in that time of awakening created an environment where we found our confidence to begin to give voice to our Indigenous thought. And I'm so pleased to tell you that many of the people from that group went on to be leaders either in education or politics. For me, this began the quest for education that acknowledged first that Indigenous people exist not as problems to be terminated or assimilated, but as people to be respected and celebrated. Second, that Indigenous peoples have knowledge systems and ways of knowing that are equally as valued as any other system. And third, that Indigenous peoples have made contributions for the benefit of the, all of us and continue to make these contributions. In the 70s, I read George Manuel and Michael Polson's book, The Fourth World, and that sets out the thoughtful proposition of a nation state containing many different cultures and life ways, some highly tribal and traditional, some highly urban and individual. Little did I know that one day, I would be involved in an institution of higher learning with a mission to achieve this very state. It has taken educators a very long time to find ways to actually implement the intentions of Indian control of Indian education. The initial implementation phase was a leap of faith, and the essential strategy was to put brown faces in brown places without curriculum that integrated culture. In many cases, educators were expected to leave culture at the door, but many Indigenous educators kept digging and looking for ways to make education work for their people and still be Indigenous, and these were the educators that I sought out. In 1982, Aboriginal and Treaty rights were enshrined in Canada's constitution. Teasing out what those rights meant would occupy jurisprudence in the, in the decades to follow, where today concepts like the duty to consult and the more rigorous concepts of free, prior, and informed consent have begun to set out how Canada's special relationship with Aboriginal peoples is to be manifested. In education, it wasn't until the 90s that we began to hear the term Indigenous knowledge used broadly in academia. At home, thankfully, people had kept our traditional knowledge alive our own knowledge systems. In the late 80s at SN at Six Nations, we consulted the community and we asked them, what kind of people do you want your children to be when they grow up? What do you want them to know? How do you want them to behave? And we were told very clearly that language, our languages and culture had to be a part of this vision of the future. And that set the foundation for SNP, Six Nations Polytechnic. From our early days in a condemned school where the only available funding was for job readiness with adult learners, SMP is now actively engaged in Indigenous education and research. Our mission, as I said, is the preservation, application, and creation of knowledge specific to Ongohoe languages and culture, and while we are respectfully interacting and informing other knowledge systems. With this mission comes that special obligation to the community, and no other institution of higher learning has this obligation. We're fortunate to have knowledge carriers, who we call Indigenous knowledge guardians, working with us to help us understand the sources and power of our knowledge from its many forms of codification, including the very nature of concept formation in our languages. We are so fortunate to have these ex this expertise, which allows us precious insight into the nature of knowing in our culture. We are actively involved in Indigenous knowledge and language recovery, restoration and revitalization through research as well as courses and programs. At SMP, learning is therefore truly transformative. Our programming and learning environments are designed so that Six Nations people can be increasingly engaged in the cultural, social and economic systems and structures that sustain our existence as Indigenous people. We also work closely to close the knowledge gap that exists in society with respect to Indigenous peoples. In this way, we're fulfilling our responsibilities and contributing to a sustainable future for all. From the first time of the first treaties, our people have understood 
the necessity of partnership and respectful collaboration. To this day, we continue with this understanding, and I'm pleased to say that Six Nations, currently, Six Nations Polytechnic currently delivers programming in partnership with nine of Ontario's publicly funded colleges and universities. Western is one of the longest standing partners of Six Nations Polytechnic, and together, our institutions have played a significant role in Indigenous education. Part of the Six Nations knowledge system is to codify understandings and relationships in wampum belts. And so a special covenant chain belt was developed to recognize our partners and in 2014, we gifted Western with one of these belts and you can see it in the Indigenous services um, space here on campus. Today I've shared with you how education has been a tool for destruction and how Indigenous education, we, and with that, we now have a tool for construction. You know the Tr Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission of Canada took five years to document the truth of what happened in residential schools. The evidence gathered was clearly sets out the destructive and the damaging power of education when it's done with unjust intentions. Until the report of the TRC was released, the words cultural de genocide applied to education and the education experience of Indigenous peoples in Canada wasn't even in the public dialogue. But those words are now being spoken by many people of influence. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission documented a very dark part of Canada's history. And while we don't want to fixate on that negativity, we can't turn our backs on it either without facing the truth and beginning the path of reconciliation. Education is about people, and it's people who make things happen. It's through education that we can and will breathe life into reconciliation and build a future filled with hope. So let's look to the future. 2017 is Canada's 150th birthday. 2017 is also a special year for Six Nations Polytechnic, as we have the opportunity to highlight our successes in Indigenous education on an international scale when we host the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. We anticipate this event will attract at least 5,000 delegates from around the globe. In planning this event, we were told by our knowledge carriers that, rec that reconciliation had to be a part of the agenda. So following this guidance, and taking into account the international scope of the conference and the fact that there have been truth and reconciliation commissions conducted around the world, we will have a portion of the conference program dedicated to developing a report card on the status of reconciliation through education on a global scale. The conference theme, a celebration of Indigenous resilience, is intentionally positive. At SMP, we are realizing the vision of Indigenous edu education. And in 2017, we'll be sharing that vision, as I said, on an international level. So on behalf of SMP, I invite you to join us in creating a hopeful future, a new chapter in Canada's history of a truly just society. The honor presented to me today is something I will share with all who have journeyed with me through the years. And to you and to all of them, I say Nyawa for being part of this journey. Congratulations, graduates, best wishes. I look forward to seeing you again. Donato. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your message today and for the outstanding work you have done on behalf of Canada's First Nations people. It is an honor to recognize your extraordinary role as an educator, advisor, researcher, and administrator who has helped transform the lives of many young people from First Nations communities in Ontario and across Canada. You have been a champion of education, and your work is an inspiration to our students and alumni around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me once again in congratulating Western's newest honorary Doctor of Laws, Dr. Rebecca Jemison. <laughs>